All right, we're live on all our feeds. Technology, Ooh. pandemic era technology. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna look at you, Neil. Uh, Instagram live, Maximum Foodie, Sashi Day. I'm here with Neil Straken, the West Coast brand ambassador for, for the Balvenie br uh, whiskey brand. And Neil, tell me how you got this awesome sounding job and position, first of all. Um, it was, it was, it was really a really, really lucky one-off uh, chance occasion that a good friend of mine has a bar company in Aberdeen that offers um, like a premium package bartender to your event, which also meant that he got a lot of whiskey events at one of our private houses at the distillery. So we have a private house, Torin, that loops onto Balvenie Distillery and guests from around the world can go there. And VIPs and, and part of the package, they could get offered cocktails on arrival. It so happened that night, it was me that was hosting that. Okay. There was a lady in question that was in the room who was the head of commercial for Southeast Asia. And she asked me if I knew the Balvenie 30. And in days gone by, I used to have a 30 in the bar that I worked in. So yeah, I knew it. Yeah. So, I, I said, you know, do you mind if I refresh my memory? So I poured a little bit into a glass, nosed it, and I was like, of course, <laughs> of any 30. So poured them their whiskeys and hosted a tasting. And after that, she presented her card, you know, in proper Asian fashion, two hands. And exactly, I, you know, I had no idea what that was at that point. And she said, you know, if you're interested in working in Southeast Asia, I've been looking for an ambassador for the Balvenie. And as someone from the hospitality industry, I've been trained for years and years by ambassadors from different alcohol companies. Right. It'd be a dream job and for the Balvenie. So that's how the whole process started. I spent four and a half years in Southeast Asia. And then I was fortunate enough to be uh, offered the job in the West Coast. Um, so I've been here for about a year and a half now. So yeah. Amazing, what a journey, wow. That sounds incredible and so fortuitous too. I mean, it, it's something that you're obviously passionate about. And when you're given a platform to champion a brand that you're passionate about and the spirit in general, I mean, that's just like a match made in heaven, yeah? Oh, yeah. And I, I also think, you know, that Scotland and, and single malt whiskey are so intertwined that the, the love of whiskey that I have really came from the people that I sold whiskey to over the years in bars. Right. They're amazing right. stories. Awesome. So speaking of whiskey, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a novice drinker. I know a little bit about whiskey primarily because I had a shoot in Ireland where I took a motorcycle once again and sort of connected all the, the distilleries of which there aren't many uh, in Ireland, but they are starting to pop up. Um, so I kind of track the story of what happened to Irish whiskey and why Scotch sort of took the lion's share of the whiskey market. So that was my uh, sort of uh, introduction to whiskey in general. So uh, I just know triple distilled has to be aged for three years. And that's literally all that I know. So I think from, I'll sort of seat myself in the audience seat and perspective and just let you guide as to how to uh, appreciate whiskey. I think that's what we're all needing some guidance on. Me, myself included. Superb. So I think, um, so, so first of all, the great thing about Scotch and always having a little jibe at the Irish, um, <laughs> got plenty of Irish friends out there, they're, they're mostly known for triple distilling their whiskey. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Scotland, we have the joke that we make it so well that we only need to distill it twice. Oh, so wow. That's, <laughs> that, that's sort of a little... <laughs> it's always got to be... <laughs> they always bite back, so it's always... Right. Got, that's awesome. <laughs> um, um, and, and really single malt scotch is, is something that is only in recent times started to get more and more popular that for years and, and still to this day, about 90% of all the whiskey that we sell from Scotland is blended scotch. And okay. single malt only makes up a very, well, you know, quite a small percentage of that. But as it's getting more and more popular and people are looking to experience bigger, more robuster flavors, single malt starts to play into that. So that's kind of where my job is. And 
I always think when people get hung up on Scotch protocol so much that I really cannot tell you how many people have just thought are horrible individuals by <laughs> telling people, oh, you should drink your whiskey like this. Oh, it's a sin to mix it with Coke or you should never right. put ice in it. The most important thing is to enjoy whiskey with good company in my eyes. That's a perfect serve, however you like it. Um, however, you know, it comes to a point where you want to know, so you want to appreciate everything that's in sure. there. Um, so I we might as well just jump into a whiskey. And oh, yeah. yeah. Line and from there and see where we go. So, so we'll start with just yeah, classic. 12-year okay. double wood. The Balvenny 12 double wood. Gotcha, gotcha. So for my Instagram live people, the reason why it's kind of pointed down is boom, that's why I got this little sample platter of whiskeys that Neil very graciously sent over. So just to run run you through them, 12 year double wood, 14 year Caribbean cask, and 17 year double wood. So that's what I have on the table. I'll just move the camera up. Boom. All right, cool. So we're we're starting off with the Balvenny 12 double wood. 12 double wood. Got it. And I have a proper uh glass oh, here. A glen a glen of professional stuff here. There we go. So um what's what's nice, you've got Glen Cairn glass there. That was a whiskey glass that was designed by the Scotch whiskey industry for Scotch whiskey. Before that glass was really designed, most people you think of just having a big, heavy crystal tumbler. Right. It really gives you no benefits for nosing and tasting. So I've got a ver something similar. This one's just stemmed. A stem allows the whiskey essentially just to be further away from any contaminants on your hand okay. or arm. Right. Um, so there's some benefits there. Now, before we know, let's talk temperature. What's what's the ideal way to store whiskey? Just cold, dark, closet? Yeah, like in a lot of ways, very similar to how you want to be keeping your, uh, your good quality wine. The only difference is never, never, ever have whiskeys on their side. Because of the higher alcohol volume, it really eats into the cork and then you'll start to get an oxidized bottle or leaking. Excellent. You want them straight up. And ever so often, if it's a special bottle of whiskey that you're wanting to keep for a long time, turn it up and that just keeps it moist, but it doesn't allow the alcohol to really eat into it. Gotcha. Um, but of course, if it's a bottle that you know that will be gone in six months, if you're careful <laughs> with it, I think... <laughs> I think we all know some disappear a little bit faster than that. Sure. sure. Um, you don't need to worry, you know. And what I like about temperature is, depending on how warm or hot the place is, some of the notes on the whiskey can be really crazy. I remember being in Langkawi, um, uh, tasting at the Four Seasons there on the beach. And the whiskey was yeah. on the beach too long. And when we got onto the 17 double route, there was this crazy green apple note, like freshly cut Granny Smith. Wow. And I'd never noticed it before. And what I found was when it's hotter, that becomes more apparent. When it's cooler, it's less there. It turns into more of like a redder, sweeter. So that's so. the, the ambient temperature of where you are presently, on the nose at least, or uh, you're, you're going to detect different things. Yeah. And, and it's one of the joys that time, place, will alter your kind of senses if you're, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not a professional on right. the, and it will tweak the opinion of what you think of that whiskey in time and place. So incredible. That's incredible. All right. So on the nose. Okay. So on the nose, like one really important thing is that uh, don't, uh, don't stick your beak all the way. <laughs> Which I already did. <laughs> um, like often you'll see probably people like myself and people that do a similar role probably doing it. It's because we're always got our nose in the glass. Um, but for a more delicate kind of nosing, really just below, just below the nose. And then breathe in, keeping your mouth open like you do with any nosing and tasting. And I personally prefer to like close my eyes, focus my olfactual sense and pick up some smells. So 
I'm going to ask you on the pressure of like, of a live show, what do you smell in the glass? You know what? Uh, I don't know if you've primed me by saying uh, green apple, but I, I actually do smell some fresh cut apple. Yeah. Maybe a hint of vanilla, uh, like honey. There's a lot of honey, honeydew kind of. Uh, so I'll stop, I'll stop you right there. You've made yourself sound like a Balvani expert straight yes. away. <laughs> <laughs> honey and vanilla is something that is part of our house style, that you'll find uh, some sort of sweetness with some sort of vanilla from a 12 all the way up to a 50 in our range. Okay. And it's interesting that you pick those two up. That's good. You passed the test. You know, you've, you've graduated the first stage. Very nice. Um, but for me on the nose, I'm picking up some like candied orange notes, um, like almost like a slight like, citrusy note with that candied orange, a little pop, uh, also a little bit of, which is another common thing within Balvenies is a stone fruits note, whether that is peaches and uh, nectarine, could be yeah. an apricot, something. There's that fruity note, and that comes interestingly through the lineup in kind of different forms. But of course, whiskey is for drinking. So, <laughs> Solange. Solange. Um, oh, yeah. And this is our first whiskey of the day, I presume. Yes, absolutely. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and, you say, and, and you say that without even blinking. Good, good. <laughs> What you'll find is the first whiskey of the day really kind of pops in the mouth. Oh, it's a bit flat. Just pops out. That's because your your mouth really isn't used to the alcohol. Yeah, like 43%, yeah. 43% this one. So you should go back. Nose again, now that you have some whiskey in your mouth. You might get some other notes. And then... Yeah. It's, it's a lot more pronounced. Not that the palate is primed. It's a lot more pronounced. Like the sweetness is really jumping out now. Yeah. So you've prepped your mouth, now it's time to enjoy a little bit. Now, bang. Um, I know um, that the Balvenie 14 Caribbean cast brought you into this world. Yeah. But many, many people, this is a whiskey that takes them into whiskey, not only just Balvenie, but the whole category. Okay. The Balvenie 12 double wood is aged in bourbon casks for 12 years, and then it's finished off in Spanish oak, Oloroso seasoned sherry butts Very for nice. no longer than nine months, roughly about six to nine months of finishing. Now, that gives this whiskey a lot of complexity, and I, I love it as our kind of entry level, you know? Right, and hence the name Double Wood, yeah? It's signifying those two elements. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about uh, the Double Wood was when we released it, it was our centenary year, it was 1993. Been making whiskey for a hundred years. They came up with a new range to celebrate that and the Double Wood was part of that. This whiskey has been our kind of flagship, our, our entry level statement ever since then. But if you look at our friends around Speyside and further afield, 27 years ago now, the whiskey world was different and they, they all sold different whiskeys, but we've, we've stood with this guy for a long time so. okay so um and just uh, just because we have followers all over the world just to give them an idea of a general uh, bottle 12 year double wood from the balvenie what are they looking at market value oh price wise price wise yes oh wow that you know that just goes into Very, a right? can of worms with uh taxation and stuff but um okay i i, I would i would say currently in the u.s um, been sending bottles and using the delivery system at the moment. So it's roughly about 70 to $80 a bottle for the 12. Um, but you can definitely get cheaper in states that oh, aren't so I just, Yeah, I just want people to have a rough, rough sort of idea of yeah. how the 12 year stands. Oh, it's so delicious. Um, and yeah, it, the, it really starts with a pop of alcohol. Younger whiskey should have that bang. Right. It wakes you up, you know, but it goes into that honey vanilla sweetness that lingers around. Yeah. And you know what? Now that my palate is really primed to the alcohol, um, I feel like I'm picking up the 
smokiness that's a little bit of, it's not like uh the because space side is not known for peat right space side whiskey is not known for peat but there is still a little bit of a smoky element that i feel like i can pick up now just a hint so what one one you've just touched on such a a beautiful <laughs> point there um and something that i fondly remember getting absolutely you know just battered by someone taking a whiskey education class when I was younger that when I said oh you can taste the peat you can you can you can smell the smoke and the the person taking the class was like Ugh, no Neil <laughs> that's the effects of the oak there's no smoke in this whiskey oh wow and I was like and I remember like feeling just this small I was like and it was in front of a huge crowd Oh, no. I love it because it's so common that a lot of people think that the effects of good quality oak onto a whiskey, there is a lot of similarities to like a smokiness or a peatiness, but it's actually the effects of using, you know, really good Spanish oak casks that will help give us that quickly as well. Interesting. So on the middle of the palate, that Spanish oak cask starts to take a hold as well, that you find that you have a dryness. Like when you drink a dry white wine, you start to salivate, you feel the oak spice playing around. And then that's, set, that's just subsides slightly. And it moves into basically like that sweet oakiness that just lingers around. Exactly. So, so as you have that whiskey in your hand, and you can sip away. Well, I, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about the history of Balvenie and what makes yeah, it? Yeah, let's, let's give uh, our viewers a, a brief uh, story about Balvenie. Oh, so I need you uh, to share my screen. I have to. Uh... Yeah, uh, I believe you should be able to do that. Share screen. There's a share screen button. Oh, yeah. It says host has disabled participant screen. Uh -huh. Gosh. What did you think I was going to be presenting? Ooh, <laughs> granted. So it's 5.30 p.m. here in California. And for you, oh, Neil, what time is it for you? Uh, it's 5.30 here in Los Angeles, California. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. The whiskey's already getting to me. <laughs> so we're, in, we're both in the Pacific Coast. It's 5.30 and we're drinking over a Zoom call. I mean... It's, it's fantastic that we can connect and talk about whiskey like this, pandemic or not. <laughs> All right. Hey, it's, it's a new world. I'm enjoying it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. so the Balvenie, a little bit into the art of the craft. And something that we pride ourselves on doing at the Balvenie is making whiskey in a very traditional uh, fashion. And we believe that the difference between good and great whiskey is that human eye in hand. Now, we're based out of Speyside in the northeast of Scotland, about an hour if you get caught behind a tractor from Aberdeen Airport to drive up to the distillery, to God's country, really. And this is kind of the original site on the distillery. And the distillery gets its name from a house that the distillery was built around. That mansion that you see kind of on the left-hand side of the picture there was a mansion that was perfect for malting barley in. And when William Grant and Sons, so they're the family that still own us to this day, once they realized they, could, they had the option of buying the land next to Glenfiddich Distillery, mm -hmm. this house was on that and it was perfect for making a floor malting. So they built the distillery around that and to this day, the distillery sits on that same site. That house got knocked down in like the 1920s and a custom made floor maltings um, was finished in 1929, which is still there to this day. So it looks a little bit different, but you, it's still there like that. And there's a little view of the house or New Balvenie Castle. Uh, it was known as the, the name Balvenie is found all around the uh, Dufftown area. There's a street named Balvenie. There's a castle that sits next door to Glenfiddich, our neighbor. And yeah, commonly used name. So, but what makes us kind of special, as I touched on, is 
at the Valvani Distillery, we have people making our whiskey. And the difference between good and great whiskey is the human die in hand. Now, when we talk about the Valvani, we pride ourselves on being the most handcrafted of single malts. And that term came, we used to describe our first bottle as single malt, but really for us nowadays, the people involved in the, the craft is, is all about these pillars of how we make our whiskey, which are the Balvenie Five Rare Crafts. And I'm gonna quickly talk through a couple of those. Sure, sure. Um, and they're not individually special just to the Balvenie, but combined together, it makes us something quite special. So the first one is that we have our own farm. Single malt barley is made out of um, three ingredients, barley, water, and yeast. And having our own farm that's next door to the uh, distillery or surrounds the distillery, a thousand acres of land, allows us to get grain to glass potentially done. And we run each year all of the homegrown barley from the distillery, uh, sorry, from that farm through our distillery. And then only this year we released our first kind of single estate bottling, which we'll touch on later, which is quite cool. So there we go. That is barley. Barley, a little bit of water and some yeast, bit of time, bang, whiskey. Bit of time, there we go, magical liquid. So the second one of our rare crafts is what starts to get whiskey geeks a little bit more excited. The second one is that we have our own floor maltings. And a floor maltings is a process or the, the place that you need to change barley into malted barley. You need to do that. So the sugars, basically break down something that the yeasts can um, process to make into alcohol. Um, most distilleries nowadays just buy in their malted barley in an industrial scale. But at the Balvenie, we are one of only six distilleries that run their floor maltings all year round in Scotland. And we're the only one on the mainland that does that. So we soak the barley in spring water for about two days and that raises the moisture in the grain up to about 45% moisture. After that, we drop it onto this floor here. And at the depth of about 14 centimeters, we have that barley sitting there. And because it's soaked up that moisture, thinks, oh, I want to grow into grain. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to grow into grass. So we're going to turn it to keep that grain oxygenated and that temperature balanced. And after about six to eight days, the gra grain is changed. We've now classified it as green malt. And inside the grain, the sugars have broken down. And we also have access to enzymes that are going to kind of kickstart fermentation. But we don't want that grain to grow into the grass. We want the sugars and the enzymes. So we must push it forward and up onto a floor that has holes in it. And below that floor, there's a furnace, a fire, that's gonna slowly dry that barley into malted barley, ready to be used. And traditionally it'd be turned by hand. This is my friend Ming with the uh, high vis on, using a, using a sheave, which is a flat shovel. And in the old days, the guys who had been turning the barley by hand, that was a problem because what you would find was that that heavy work of turning and turning the barley would give you a bad shoulder and you would see people walking around whiskey country with a shoulder that was poked up and it was painful and they would call that monkey shoulder. So if anyone out there has ever heard of um, yeah. our brand or blended malt monkey shoulder, the name comes from that. So a bit of insight there. And I've sadly no picture of the fire, but is it time we jump onto your favorite whiskey now in between? Yes. Rashman? I think so. I think so. We can jump off of this for a second and go back onto the tasting side. Yes. I am all about that. Sorry if I'm moving it around, guys. There's... I get quite carried away talking about like, the guys back home know so oh, sure i mean what what I, my takeaway point from that was everything's done in-house the a to z process it's all done in-house and that's 
that's something to be really proud of. Absolutely, you know. Yeah, and very few distilleries have those first two stages. It's easier for them just to buy it at an industrial level. Oof, I'm getting the opportunity of a fresh bottle here as well. Wow. It's nice. All right, cool. So we are moving on to the 14-year-old Caribbean cask, which I'll let you explain it. It's as, as far as in uh, rum cask. Yes. Indeed, finished in rum casks. So th this is great. This is the whiskey that brought us together, essentially, and uh, got us talking. So it's hard to argue with the whiskey like that. But I described the 12 Double Wood very much as like my day-to-day -day drinking whiskey any time of the day. It just works. The 14-year-old Caribbean cask, and, and it's probably an interesting way to talk about single malt, but this is my Friday night whiskey. This is my party whiskey. <laughs> and obviously with your experiences in Southeast Asia, you know how they drink over there. Bottle down on the table, and then you just see how the night goes. Sure. We used, this used to be a fond favorite at the weekend. And what's lovely about it is I find it quite a playful whiskey. That's why I liken it to my weekend whiskey, my Friday night fun whiskey. Right. Um, so on the nose, what do you smell that's different? Or do you smell anything s similar? It seems like it's a little bit more uh, pronounced, like a little bit more amplified. Okay. So a little bit more, uh, almost like sharpness of alcohol, maybe some people might describe that as. Well, not, not sharpness of alcohol, but like that sweetness. It's like it's ready to punch you harder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that. I, uh, I, <laughs> I like that a lot, actually. It's ready to punch you a little bit harder. I get that a lot. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from on that, that this whiskey has just been aged in American oak. So a lot of the kind of rawness of the alcohol, the little poppiness of the alcohol, which is, I think, so important for younger whiskeys, kind of comes through. So this whiskey has spent 14 years in ex-bourbon casks, and then it's been finished off in barrels that have held rum. But we don't just buy old used rum casks. We can't guarantee quality or consistency in the product. So for this whiskey, we have to really go the extra mile. And what we find is that we have to buy a blend of rum. That blend of rum, before you ask, it's a blend of rum. Like a blend of scotch is a blend of scotch. Mm -hmm. Who knows what goes into it, but we get to where we need to with flavor profile. Mm -hmm. So as long as that flavor profile is right, it works. It is aged in new American oak barrels, so it's never had anything else in it before. And for six months, we age that rum in those new American oak barrels. During that time, the oak soaks up some of that rummy goodness and the rum is gonna interact with flavors, things in there that are gonna affect the flavor of our spirit. So we don't look at aging or, or finishing in the way that, oh, it's giving us a sherried flavor, oh, it's giving us a rum flavor. It's actually more affecting what's in the oak that when we put our spirit in, it interacts slightly differently with that oak. So it's a little bit more nuanced as opposed to, you know, we're just gonna finish this in a rum barrel. It's it's a lot more nuanced. Yes, yeah. And, and you know, and, and that's there to give us consistency of what we're doing so we can keep on producing this. But what, I, what makes this like whiskey, I think so much fun is that rum finishing. And on the nose straight away, I start to think of like tropical fruit notes. And for me, a personal one is in Scotland, you know, pineapple it seems a very tropical fruit, but it's never ripe. So when I, you know, started getting into food and drink programs, I watched all the chefs in the markets smelling the food. So I started doing that from a young age. I was working in kitchens at 16. But whenever you pick up a pineapple in the supermarket in Scotland, it is nowhere near ready to eat. It has to sit in the fruit basket for at least six days next to the bananas before right. you put a knife through it. And that kind of green freshness is a kind of tropical fruit note I get on this whiskey. Also, 
you know, because you know it's a rum finished whiskey, I start to pick up a little bit of um, kind of like heavier sugar notes, like that molasses, that treacle note, but molasses comes to mind. But I think something that's relevant for you that finally someone that I'm speaking to America knows what I'm talking about is Gula Malacca. So that Malaysian cane sugar with the, it has almost like a coconutty kind of light note to it. And that's how I would describe yeah, it. It's, it's, it's hard to articulate what you're getting on the nose, but when I meant, uh, when I said um, it's, it's, it's kind of amplified, it's, it's like more punchy, that's like the sugary, that, that vanilla-ness, that's what I meant. It's like a little bit more pronounced. Yeah. And that's that rum, you know, if we, if we think what, what rum is, it's made of a cane base, whether it's molasses or fresh sugar cane, it's going to, I think, always going to elevate or ramp up some sweetness in, in what you're drinking if you're aging in those casts. So, yeah. Absolutely. And the finish on this is way different than the 12-year-old. Yeah. Uh, so, again, on the mouth, this whiskey is just a different beast. A little bit older, different finishing cast. And I almost call it and describe it as a little bit more simpler than the 12. Because the 12 kind of bounces you around in the mouth. This is all a little bit more balanced and consistent. Yeah, we have that pop of alcohol at the start, but we have that lovely vanilla, oaky sweetness that lingers around in the mouth. And then just at the finish of the palate, a tingle of alcohol spice. It's not the yeah. heavier oak spice that we got from like the 12 and the sherry cask, but it's just a little, oh yeah, you're still drinking whiskey. Just remember that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. And this is actually what, uh, it's, it's a funny story, quarantine, uh, my buddy and I decided to just go buy a nice whiskey. Somehow we picked Balvenie, the Balvenie, the Caribbean cask, came back, we both sipped on it. I was amazed by it. And then I decided to just randomly cold pitch an idea for Maximum Foodie with the Balvenie and then boom, stars align. It turns out that the person was based in Singapore and she could catch the premiere of the show in Asia. So we got to talking and boom, now you and I connected. Yeah, it's just amazing what can happen over a drink. And, and what's great about whiskey, you know, it, there's nothing more that pulls on the heart sting, strings and creates memories than a good bottle of single malt scotch, you know? Yeah, you're here. So as you're sipping and enjoying that, if we can jump back onto Balvenie Five Rare Crafts and also talk about really one of the gifts that I sent you as well. Because, oh, get on here. Because it revolves around the gentleman with the white hair. Um, that the third one of the Balvenie Five Rare Crafts is that we have our own coppersmiths on site. And then it's for basically anyone that does my job as an ambassador for the company, he's our hero. He is our legend. Because Dennis, to my knowledge, is the longest serving member of staff at William Grant and Sons, other than family members, that he's worked for the company for, I believe, 63 years now. Wow. And What's great about spending time with Dennis is you hear the stories of the old days. And I kind of joke often that the old days were kind of the days I should have been at the distillery. <laughs> you know, health and safety wasn't a thing. Alcoholism at that time in Scotland probably wasn't a thing either. You were just Jimmy that likes a drink. You know, it was like, oh, Jimmy's an affa bugger with a drink. And that would be about as bad as it would ever be. Right, right. Um, and you know, the industry around that time, a lot of people were kind of looking to bolster their wages by stealing or drinking whiskey wherever it was in the stage of production. People like alcohol. Um, so those stories of the good old days with Dennis, and I sent you something that really celebrates Dennis's story, which is the copper thing there. Now you have the slightly smaller usable handout to customers version of that. But I have my proper Balvenie one that was 
the official uh, gift to me as I joined the ambassador team. I so see. a little bit bigger and a full no, size. You did the right thing. This size is perfect for a travel show host. It fits in my pocket. It's portable. It, it's totally my style. I will only raise one point of the only thing is these things never look good on airport scanners. When you look at the kind of bigger ones, I presume they just look like pipe bombs. And if I, I pretty much stop traveling with mine because I just half the time, especially in LEX, they're not that interested in what this is. Sometimes in a little bit more friendly or quieter airports, I can be like, oh, this is what that is. But um, yeah, be careful. All right. But if you get it taken off you, I'll get you another one. Um, but this story of this and, and what this is, is called a uh, copper dog. And it was something that the old distillery workers would have that Dennis's copper smith would make for the distillery workers. And what this was, was a whiskey stealing tool, essentially. That if you go back decades, the distilleries would have XL men, tax men living on site because we really couldn't be trusted, you know, with all that whiskey at that point. So there'd be an exile man on, but of course the warehouseman still had to move whiskey around from time to time, doors would be left open. And if you ever found yourself in a warehouse by yourself, you wouldn't want to be unprepared. You'd want to have your man's best friend on him, your dog. And what they would do would be on shift or before when they were setting up for work in the morning, they would throw this down their pants. I don't know if we can uh, get onto that, but they would drop it and slide it and it would be down their leg. And whenever they had the opportunity to get into a cask, they would kick the end of the cask. That pops the bunghole up, checking around no one's watching, screw off the top. Click, 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 click. Ah, I see. Pull it out, put the top back on, down your pants. And then you've got something nice to drink on your walk back home to the uh, wife in the evening. Wow. So I had no idea. I, I was wondering why the chain was so long. I didn't know there was a historical reason behind it. And, and also, like, I've, I've actually got a custom made one from Dennis as well. I never knew I was going to get presented this. So at the distillery, he made it, I got one of his last ones that he made with a penny piece. And Oh, I treasure it. It actually doesn't leave my home in Scotland. I treasure it so much. But it's probably a bit more realistic because it doesn't use a chain. It uses string, or as they would call it up in uh, Dufftown, tau. A little bit of tau because it's not going to have that rattle in your ah, back. Okay. It's going to give you away. <laughs> I see. So there we go. Yeah. And so we, we celebrate, you know, Dennis by talking about the copper dog. And Dennis has worked for us for so long, but when we talk about master craftsmen in, in the journey through the five rare crafts, Dennis is very much that. He's spent a long time working at the distillery. He knows his job inside out. The only thing that's getting to him just now is his body's probably just not able to lift that big mallet that he has in his hand there so often. And the journey of a craftsman for us finishes with the master craftsman. But before that, you go through the craftsman's jerk time where you really understand what you're doing and you're just serving your time to get to that master craftsman's level. Mm -hmm. But the first stage before that is the apprentice stage. And every master craftsman starts with an apprentice, being an apprentice to some master with us. And it's paramount to what we do that we have people like Dennis at the distillery passing down the correct, the traditional right way of making whiskey. Wow. And again, coming back to that difference. And this is where the magic happens. This is what Dennis and the chap that was next to him, sorry, I should definitely mention George Singer uh, there in the red overalls, but this is what they're looking after. And this is our still room, our spirit still room. They stick stills, five in the picture there. And that size and shape of the stills is gonna give us really the, 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 uh, the foundations to mm. our whiskey. And depending on size and shape of the still, that's going to 
really give you either a lighter style of whiskey or a heavier style. And depending on how much work that spirit vapor has to do to come out of the other side of that still into the condensers, means kind of how much reflux that spirit vapor gets on the still. So how much it's rolling back down and how much right. copper contact the spirit has. Balvenie, we make our spirit vapor work quite hard. So we get quite a light, uh, sweet, malty spirit coming off of our stills. But if they were to be smaller and for the vapor to rise out easier, you get an oilier, more robust, heavier spirit. So, you know, there's a 120 plus single malt distilleries in Scotland, all with different sizes and shapes. So there's a lot to choose from. That's everybody has their own unique signature. Yes, on that size and shape. But over time, that copper reacts with congeners in the still and heat and other aspects, makes that copper thinner. And over time, you'll see on the screen, there's lines up there on the, on the still. And because over time, certain parts get thinner. And Dennis, with all of his years experience, can tap away on different parts of the still to work out how thin or thick it is to make sure that we, we can be running at full production the whole time. And to have a quality made still, everyone thinks is so, so important and it really is. Um, so that's great that we have Dennis on site for that. Now, just before we kind of move on to the last whiskey and the last one of the five rare crafts, fourth rare craft, it's really, a, once we take that liquid out of those stills, it goes into casks. And those casks are so important to the flavor of our whiskey. About 70% of everything that we have in here comes from them. And depending on what casks you use, it'll give us different flavors. Ex-bourbon casks, sweetness, vanilla notes, sherry butts are gonna be rich, heavier spice notes, big, more robuster flavor notes. And then port pipes, it's going to give you some like red wine influence, so more kind of varied sweetness to whiskies, which is quite interesting. But those casks have to be built by coopers, and coopers are an exceptionally old trade. And having our own cooperage on site allows us to have the finest quality of casks to age our spirit in. And there's our cooperage. You see the guys working with their hands, still knocking those hoops down to tighten it up. And what I really love about the cooperage is the tools that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the people that work in there, they've been passed down generation to generation. Another craft. It's a, a, a complete craft. And, and the craft of coopering dates back over 3,000 years. It's come from Africa. Uh, I believe the Morgs took it into Europe uh, around about Roman times. And let's be honest, barrels were far superior to pottery at long transport. So barrels start to win that. People start aging all manner of things in them and transporting it. Casks, oh, give her whiskey or, or aquavit in those days. Oh, some color. Ah, oh, it tastes better. Hey presto, we have that. But what's cool about our cooperage for like a whiskey geek is you never know what they're going to be working on. Having our own cooperage allows us to experiment, to play around with different casks that if you buy from an industrial source or an industrial cooperage, everyone knows what you're buying. Everyone knows what you're playing around with. So it keeps things in house and it keeps us tweaking things to make yeah, R&D basically your R&D department is in-house so you can, you're always trying new things uh, a beautiful way to describe it yeah the, the old the old the old the old whiskey world's R&D session that's amazing so this whiskey and the, well, the last whiskey um, we should move on to to celebrate this gentleman here that's the 17 double wood Probably a little bit small on my screen just now, but the Balvenie is 17 old. Now, um, this whiskey was designed to kind of celebrate two things, that success of the 12 double wood, but also 50 years of service of the fifth and final one of the five rare crafts. David Charles Stewart, 
the longest serving whiskey maker in the Scotch whiskey industry and the first ever master blender or malt master of a whiskey company to be awarded an MBE from Queen Elizabeth II, our queen, um, and a huge accolade that was for him. But David Stewart is pretty important because he helped shape what we drink today in the world of single malt. And he's one of the very few that are still in the game that really, when you walk into any bar in the world and you see the wide array of whiskey that's there, he's the one that's really helped shape that. Now, um, on to the whiskey. It celebrates David by kind of showcasing and using something that he pioneered, which was double cask maturation or the finishing process, mm -hmm. and really did such a good job of it in the double wood 12 that if we use that same style, what happens to the liquid five more years into cask? And I think that once you get into 16, 17, 18 years old, whiskey starts to change, starts to take on some more older effects. And that alcohol really softens in the mouth. Yeah. Immediately on the nose, you can tell this is a way, way more mature whiskey. It's smooth. It's not, it doesn't have that punch factor anymore. It's like a gentleman now. It's a refined, smooth, you know, gentleman. <laughs> and when we touched on the other two, I said, you know, any day, time of day whiskey, fun weekend party whiskey. This is Neil's being a good boy whiskey. But this is the first one in our range that slows me down, that I spend a lot of time nosing it, sipping it, yeah. spending a lot of time getting to know it. And every time you pick up different little things and I just, oh, I think it's beautiful. Immediately you can tell this is a way more mature whiskey. That's like, as far as tasting notes, I don't think I have the, the know-how or the palate sense to describe what I'm smelling. But on a very crude level, I can definitively say that this is way more gentle. You can tell it's matured. And uh, yeah, I'll let you describe the, the nose. <laughs> well, well to, be, to be fair, if I, if I didn't do this for a living, there would be no way I would be going live broadcasting to the world, my <laughs> nosing notes on anything. I'd be exceptionally shy as well. But I love on the nose, I touched on that green apple note uh, when I was in Langkawi on the beach, mm -hmm. but it's not there just now. My, I'm, I'm living, I'm a Scotsman living in LA. I've got my air conditioning on. Yeah. So it's quite cool in here. Can I just say, uh, I, I recently bought this item so I can relate to that smell, but I'm picking up dates. Like, dates? Yeah. Great, great. So for me, I first of all get that kind of apple note, that links I can never really lose that from my memory on this whiskey. But because it's been finished in those sherry casks and it's had longer time just aging, the dried fruit notes that are definitely apparent from that sherry cask are a lot heavier and richer. Mm -hmm. So dates, raisins, definitely common things to be picking up on this whiskey. Wow. Of course, whiskey's drinking. But you get a whiskey that is totally different to the first two. That those first two had that pop of alcohol. Mm -hmm. No, you don't get it at the start. And this is also the first whiskey that gets under your tongue, gets under your gums as well. It's really big. And I, I love it as like almost like a digestive style whiskey where at the end of a full meal with a couple of bottles of red, you can sit down with this and just chill out and it cuts above that. Such a good way to describe this. That's absolutely the setting that I would imagine. Absolutely. And I think it's like regality and decadence. It really bounces flavor around your mouth. It's consistent to what we know as Balvenie, mm -hmm. but it just got richer and fancier. You know, <laughs> um, it's just oak spice, vanilla, but just huge, rich, almost like pri old old fashioned private club with lots of leather and old books. Yeah, cases, yeah. leather, exactly, picking up all of that. Now, but it's only really when you swallow it that the, you know, the alcohol is there, there is an apparency there. But I notice that instead of that pop at the start, 
the alcohol kind of gets you in the throat and it's like a lovely warming whiskey alcohol that kind of just hugs you from the inside. For some well. reason, I find that it coats the palate a lot more than the other two. Yeah, and that's just that time, that little bit longer, just it, it's amazing how how much bigger this was he really is. So yeah, it's, it's my special occasion, kind of like, oh, let's, let's be good, let's enjoy this moment. Yeah, wow. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the ether, right? That, that time, I mean, we have so much technology now, but it's something that we can accelerate the maturation of spirits in, in barrels, right? That's something that we can't replicate synthetically. Um, it just has to take its sweet time. I, I think the people that kind of make that, some of the synthetic stuff would argue they're very good at it, but I've always kind of had one issue that the rounding off of the alcohol is never quite there. And even when you're using smaller casks, so micro maturation that imparts more flavor, it never rounds off the alcohol and settles the alcohol down like a slow maturation does in a Scottish warehouse. And I think we got to keep that mystery element too. It's in the ether, you know. <laughs> it's, it's one of the wonders. And I, I'm so fortunate to have spent so much time with David Stewart over the years in Scotland or over in Asia that when you start to like sample essentially the same liquid that's come off those stills, how it changes through the decades in different casks from different places around the world and even casks that you expect to taste one way, the surprise of oak that can change it. And really that's a lot of David's job and David's experience for, uh, oh gosh, now, oh, this is really bad. I should know this off the top of my head, 57 years of working for us. Mm -hmm. He, he knows, but he'll still be surprised by some things that he sees in Oak. And this is his kind of room. And I'm laughing there and I'm smiling so much there, not because David's told a joke, because that morning we drank all of Balvenie's full range from 12 double wood up to 50, about 30, sorry, 13 different bottles of whiskey. So I'm happy because I'm a little bit, woo, yeah. I got a little whiskey head on me. Um, and you're with a genuine legend. Yeah, it just, I just, delighted to be in there and I and that's young Neil as well that's before the rigors of uh, living in Southeast Asia um, came to me but his his room there is his nosing and tasting in his blending room and mm -hmm. when David started in the business people didn't drink single malt he started with us in 1963 and in 1963 it was only Glenn Fiddick her older brother that had just started internationally marketing Glenfiddich. So nobody in the world was drinking single malt other than I would say just us hardy Highlanders up in, up in Scotland that was needing something to warm us up. And he started not as a blender, but as a 17 year old boy, he'd left school and he started as a clerk of stocks, basically a bookkeeper. And he could have been anywhere in the business but he was fortunate enough to work under the then master blender for the whole company, Hamish Robertson. Now, Hamish Robertson took a shine to David. Honestly, if you meet David, you'll never not like him. He is a prime example of how the nicest people in the world behave. And he took a shine to him and started teaching him the art of blending. And then about 12 years after David started, Hamish left the business. And there was no one at William Grant and Sons that knew how to make the blend, apart from a young David Stewart. At this stage, I don't even think 30 yet. So the family, and, and this is his words, this is how he recalls it, he knew that the family were looking for someone more experienced. That, of course, the job as master blender is very important. When you're blending whiskey, if you make a mistake, it's costly. Yeah, yeah. So they were probably looking for someone more experienced, but as no one else knew how to do it for six months, David did the job and in his words, he goes, oh yes, I, I didn't make any mistakes in that six months. So they kept me on <laughs> and you're like, what do you mean, David? They just kept you on. Because when we look at what David has done, not only with Balvenie as being the only person that's ever made the Balvenie, Hence the reason why his signature 
is on every one of the bottles, that he's really helped shape what we drink as a whole, whether it is single malt scotch. When you're talking about Taiwanese whiskeys, when you're talking about Japanese, the world that is just whiskey, David's helped shape, tweak what we drink to this day. He helped make Glenfiddich the biggest selling single malt in the world. He made a fantastic blend in grants for years, but it's with the Balvenie that he's really recognized. And every one of our whiskeys have gone through this process called double cask maturation. Mm -hmm. And that process is something David pioneered with the Balvenie Classic, a bottling of Balvenie in 1983. And so he's seen as a legend uh, for that. And I think when you go through these three whiskeys, only a really small amount of what David's produced for the Balvenie, you mm -hmm. see the wonders of what finishing can give to a whiskey. So. Yeah. And there we go. There's David meeting the Queen, getting his MBE. So I think uh, other than a video, we don't, which will probably not work as it's Zoom, we'll jump back off of sharing. But that is the Balvenie and David being the fifth and final, one of the five rare crafts. Although he's not working at the site, he's the one that rounds up all those other five rare crafts. So having our own farm, having our own floor maltings, copper smiths and coopers on site are exceptionally rare. And they're the ones really making grafting and David is the one that links all that hard work together and, and makes it into something beautiful, something that we can enjoy together. So it's been a huge important part of that. Yeah, it's amazing how much importance is put on these singular individuals that are just master craftsmen and masters of their trade. You know, whether it's a malt master or a, a copper still maker, it's an amazing amount of reliance on those people to perform and, and call on their abilities that they've cultivated for, you know, 50 plus decades. That's just astounding to me. And I think one of the things that is nice about the distillery is because we're still owned by that same family that started off the distillery all that time, mm -hmm. we don't make whiskey in a cheap fashion. It's probably more expensive having all these people around. Most distilleries you'll find a computer and a person monitoring it. Yes, they probably have the skills to do what, you know, it's a computer that runs its last people. Right. But these people in our distillery have got a say on process and tweaking things. And some of the things that David has put into our process and our aging and how our stock model works are time consuming, expensive, Many distilleries, if not any, do these things, but David told the family, look, this is the right way to make whiskey. This is how we should be doing it. And they have a lot of leeway to experiment and play around like that as well. So, you know, this is only very much a touch of the surface into the stories of uh, the Balvenie. Once we catch up when I'm back up north, there'll be more. <laughs> um, but it's an amazing, amazing distillery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really enjoyed all three are fantastic whiskeys, but uh, you can just tell that uh, time takes its toll in a good way with the 17. I mean, you just taste how different it is. And yeah, it's, it's tremendous. So really, really enjoyable experience and a good way to bolster my knowledge, um, you know, as much as best as we can do over the internet during these times but uh, very much looking forward to our future uh, collaboration and seeing with my own eyes <laughs> the a to z process and showcasing it on maximum foodie so really looking forward to that but this was amazing <laughs> thanks so much for the the walkthrough my from absolute pleasure finish it off beautifully slanjavar slanjavar <laughs> cheers That wraps it up for us. All right, I'll catch up with you soon, Neil. Thanks for your time. Thanks, goodbye.